Okay, we'll now begin our first session of the week, Arizona Government 101 and League Resources for Municipal Officials. Our speaker this morning is Tom Belshi. Tom is the Executive Director for the League of Arizona Cities and Towns. He assumed the role of Executive Director in January of this year. Prior to that, from 2005 until uh, January of this year, Tom served as our Deputy Director here at the League. Prior to coming to the League as the Deputy Director, he was the Assistant Deputy Director for the Department of Commerce, overseeing the operations of the Community Development Division. He also served as the Executive Director and Community Development Manager of the Greater uh, Arizona Development Authority, also known as GATA, where he developed technical assistance and community outreach programs for them. Uh, but Tom's role as Deputy Director and, and Executive Director of the League was not his first time at the League. Prior to going over to the Department of Commerce, he worked here at the League for five years where he was uh, he helped coordinate our technical assistance program, uh, which included our trainings, our publications, conferences, website, and inquiry program. Um, and then before that, he worked in the city manager's office uh, of Provo, uh, Utah. He received his Bachelor of Science in Economics and his Master of Public Administration from Brigham Young University. And uh, we're glad to have Tom as our first speaker. So Tom, I'll now turn it over to you. Thank you, Matt, and welcome to all of our participants this morning. Um, this is a little odd for me. I'm used to interacting with uh, live faces. Uh, I much prefer that, but um, we, I'm also grateful that we do have this level of technology that we're still able to, to hold this despite everything that's going on around us. Uh, I'd like to start off also by saying that uh, congratulations to all of you that have been elected. It's um, it's an amazing feeling of trust that you receive from your constituents, that uh, you have their, their best issues at, uh, at heart, that, that you, uh, their best interests, that you want to make a difference in your community. And here at the League, what we try to do is make that a reality by helping you to be effective um, and to learn about best practices, learn about how cities and towns uh, how they work, what things are required, what things can get you in trouble, uh, and also to just um, help you to understand how uh, cities and towns fit in the overall structure um, of the, um, the governmental structure of our country. So um, I want to start a little bit and talk about that. Um, we understand that we have, um, in, in our American um, uh, government, we have three branches. Uh, we understand their purpose and their, and their role. We understand that with, within that, that we also have the state government, and then we have a whole variety of, of local government of which city, cities and towns are just a part. But um, we understand that uh, government is, is there to help us to accomplish certain goals to provide uh, public services and to provide an organization to society and how it operates. Uh, at the League, we are big believers in the dignity of public service. I wanna start out and just let you know that um, one of the reasons that I um, have been here so long at the League is because I was raised with the idea of public service and the importance of public service. Um, my father was a police officer for 30 years um, he also ran for school board. My mother ran for uh, city council. And so um, municipal topics, uh, uh, state topics, federal topics were a big part of growing up in, in my home. And I absolutely believe that, the, that what you're undertaking is, can be difficult, but very rewarding. And we hope to, um, to help you to understand where cities and towns fit into that, that larger picture. And uh, so let's just jump in right now and talk a little bit about how cities were formed. A lot of people don't realize that um, we had uh, several cities and towns that predated statehood. Uh, they had what was referred to as territorial charters. Uh, and in fact, when we get into uh, our charter, uh, part of our discussion today will be about uh, charter cities. And one of our cities still has their territory, territorial charter in place, and that is the city of Tombstone. Um, why were they created? They were created to, um, to ease many things. And so 
as uh, transportation between population centers became important, uh, that was one of the reasons that was formed. Uh, police services, security was a, a big part of, of why cities were formed. Um, efficient use of, of, of services and resources, someplace where you could go to one location and, uh, and get the things that you needed uh, to start businesses, to build homes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, commerce was facilitated uh, through the forming of cities and that feeling of community and um, wanting to formalize uh, some of those things to make sure that that feeling of community was protected by, by law and order, so to speak. Um, cities and towns in Arizona, why do we exist? We exist because people wanted uh, to create us. In all of the surveys that we do about um, the uh, popularity of certain levels of government, when we do surveying and ask about how people feel about the federal level, the state level, uh, county, cities and towns, local government, especially cities and towns, always come out um, very high at the top. Why? Because they're the level, we are the level of government closest to the people. Um, you can go down to, to City Hall, um, you know who your mayor and council members are. Uh, you may, they may even live in your neighborhood. Uh, and so one of the things that um, newly elected officials find out very quickly is that you can no longer go to a restaurant or especially in the, our smallest of our communities, you can't go to a restaurant, go to the store without people recognizing who you are and wanting to strike up a conversation. Um, that just uh, goes to the fact that we have an open, accessible form of government and people trust it. Um, we believe that the best decisions are made locally of the 91 cities and towns here in Arizona, um, they're all very different. I've had the wonderful opportunity of my 20 years with the, with the league to visit all cities and towns several times. And I can tell you that, that there are no two alike. Um, we may have uh, similar values and, and those types of things, but people make a decision about where they live um, based on, on those values. And so it's very interesting to hear uh, stories about people, why they located in a, in a particular community. And we believe that local control and local decisions are the best decisions. And uh, that is one of the founding foundational issues that created the league is that we believe in protecting uh, the right for you as duly elected officials to make decisions about your communities and not other levels of government. Um, Cities and towns uh, really are at their heart providers of services. And we are uh, in many ways like uh, a, a business or a corporation, which we'll talk about a, a little bit later. And we, we strive very hard to deliver that value, deliver the services that our constituents need and want um, at, the, at the lowest cost possible. Um, we're very, also very pr proud of the fact that cities and towns in Arizona are nonpartisan. Now, we're not saying that uh, uh, elected officials that sit on the city or town council don't have, are, are not part of, of parties, but when they run for local office, they do not run under a, a party banner. They run as a, um, they run as a, uh, an independent, um, uh, candidate that is not associated with any party. And the decisions that are made, if you think about it, whether or not your road gets paved, your toilets flush, your, your um, traffic lights change, that doesn't have anything to do with uh, partisan platforms. Those are things that, that everyone wants. And so those are the types of, that's one of the reasons that, that we remain nonpartisan. Um, again, very trusted level of government and, um, you'll become part of, of that tradition. Um, mayors and city councils, again, just to uh, drive the point home, you can see um, the approval ratings that we receive from cities and towns. Again, uh, that's just an illustration of the fact that, uh, that we're open and accessible uh, to everyday citizens. Um, 
Arizona city government was included in the original uh, Arizona constitution. Most of, uh, most of what you see in the constitution is clarified in title nine of the Arizona Re revised statutes. We're gonna spend a lot of time going through uh, things, especially that are related to your performance as uh, mayors and council members um, in uh, Title IX. So we're going to talk about a lot of different issues um, uh, that we'll get to that we'll get to later. Uh, but the Constitution is the one that sets the framework and the revised statutes clarify those things that are in the Constitution and answer questions that may come up. And uh, really, um, for the most part, and we'll, again, we'll talk about charter cities, but most cities and towns um, in the state are, are general purpose governments. They are, they, are um, they depend on the revised statutes and the constitution for the conduct of uh, what they do um, in day-to-day um, in -day activities. Um, we often get asked about the difference between a city or town. In, in Arizona, in, in order to incorporate, and again, this just goes back to the whole idea, the idea that cities and towns would get together and they would incorporate, will tie very nicely when we talk about uh, the form of government that cities and towns in Arizona have adopted. But we go through the process of people locally who would like uh, who are now just part of the county, who may live in a community that is not incorporated and they want to incorporate, they will actually choose and go through a process called incorporation. In order to, to be eligible to incorporate as a city or town, you have to have at least 1,500 people uh, to incorporate. In order to incorporate as a city, you have to have at least 3,000 people. Um, charter cities are the only difference between a city and a town in Arizona. Most all of the powers, uh, every power that is available to a city is available to a town except for charter cities. So let's use my, uh, my home, which is the town of Gilbert, which is one of the largest towns in the whole country, um, over 250,000 people now uh, that they're estimating. Um, after the census is completed. Um, they are a town, uh, but they have all the same powers that the city of Mesa has, um, except for those powers that are granted to the city of Mesa through their charter. If the town of Gilbert wanted to become a charter city, they would have to first have an election to become a city. They would have to have at least 3000 people to do that. And then once they became, uh, they elected to become a city, they could go through the process of adopting a charter. Charters uh, would take us another hour and a half to explain. Um, that is something that, uh, as that's another presentation that we do as league staff is to come out and talk about the purpose of charters, the types of things that, that you do. But, but charters are a way to limit and allow um, greater flexibility to a charter cities than um, are available to regular uh, cities and towns. But even that is changing. It used to be that um, cities and towns or, or a city could only have a city manager if it was part of their charter. Uh, the state legislature gave that power to cities and towns um, uh, just a little while ago, uh, in, or, uh, uh, they gave that power to cities and towns um, not long after uh, the many cities and towns began, began incorporating um, the council manager form of government. So there are lots of things that uh, charter cities can do um, uh, that are they are allowed to do um, that general law cities can't do, but there are also things that limit it. Uh, many of the, um, there's uh, tax limitations, there's um, limitations on the types of procurement you can do. Um, but again, as I say, uh, charter city discussion is a long one and a complicated one. And so uh, we won't spend a lot of time on it today, but uh, that is the basic difference between a city or town is the ability to adopt a charter. Um, 
also, um, we want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, the cities, counties, and, and other local governments. Um, as you know, uh, cities and towns are located within counties, but they do not answer to um, the counties for uh, their form of government like we do to the state. The state can, uh, can adopt things that uh, uh, cities and towns have to follow. If there's a state law passed uh, that regulates our activities, we have to follow those things. Counties don't fall into that role. However, um, county health departments and others may issue um, uh, mandates that uh, all cities and towns across uh, the county may have to, to, to follow, but uh, they can't pass laws um, that uh, apply to cities and towns. Uh, you may, besides counties, um, you're probably familiar with uh, school districts, uh, fire districts. There are lots of special taxing districts that are formed. Normally, um, uh, special taxing districts like uh, water districts or road districts that operate out in counties are done uh, because uh, the citizens are not ready to become a city or town, but they have a particular need for uh, a service like, like water and sewer, or they don't have a fire department. So they get together and join or, or form a, uh, a fire district. All of those forms of government have their own governing boards. And so they are separate uh, from, um, in our state, the school boards operate with their, their own um, uh, governing board, and they're not associated with uh, cities and towns, the same with fire districts. Now, that doesn't mean that those governments don't meet, they don't cooperate, and, and they don't uh, plan together. It just means that the governing boards are separate and, and that it can be different uh, uh, than other, um, other states. So all of those special taxing districts have their own uh, governing board. Um, so what do we do then? What do we focus on as cities and towns? Um, you see the questions up on the slide. We are the get it done level of government. Um, what are the basic services that we have in common? It may surprise you to know that cities and towns are only required to, um, to provide uh, police services, road services, and um, administrative services, uh, which include things like uh, a clerk that um, provides information about the meetings, uh, posts, uh, ordinances, or other things that are going to be passed. Um, you know, also it has to do with liability insurance and those types of things. But the big services that you think about um, that cities and towns provide. Uh, the only ones that are required are, again, public uh, safety or, or um, police, because again, many cities and towns belong in a fire district, so we're not required to provide fire service, although many of us do. Uh, it just po police service, and also uh, we have to maintain um, all of the roads within our communities. That's really um, uh, the two things that are required. So the other things like water, sewer, uh, that would fall under public works, parks and recreation, um, all of those types of things are all services that are requested by the citizens. And, um, and so from time to time, those services may change. And um, you may elect to drop a service, you may elect to, to adopt a new one. Um, that is up the city or town and the citizens that, that are within it. Um, what types of things do we look for? We look for ways, again, we're very focused on quality of life. So we're looking, again, public safety is a big concern. Safe neighborhoods, um, local and regional parks and recreation facilities, um, clean air and water, cities and towns, um, join regional organizations that take a look at um, things like clean air, um, we're locally, we have our uh, water and sewer systems uh, that we operate and uh, that are very, very important, obviously, to the development and to a high quality of life. We focus a lot on streets and roads. Um, 
that is something that I believe people take for granted every day when they back out and, and drive on their way to work is that all those street lights and sidewalks and curb and gutter and, um, and streets are all part of um, the city system that, that keeps them um, paved and up to date. And even though it's sometimes we're not provided adequate funding to do that, we, we strive uh, to keep those high quality streets and roads up because we not only know how important it is to everyday life, it's important to uh, business and economic development. Uh, we, we work with developers to keep a modern housing stock and, uh, and we, we also are very focused um, on retail uh, development as well as commercial and industrial where it makes sense. Now this all goes back to what we are is our planning agencies, cities and towns plan. Um, they focus more on five years, 10 years, 20 years. Uh, we look down the road at what are, what are our communities going to be like in, in those time frames, and we plan accordingly. So we have things like 10-year um, general plans. We are required to by law, but um, most cities and towns have been doing that since the very beginning. That kind of document allows you to know where you're going, what you're doing, where you plan to to have housing, where you plan to have retail, where you plan to have commercial and industrial, and to make sure that it's um, that it peacefully coexists with the life that is being led by the people who live in your community. Many people don't know that even though this, uh, the state and the federal government are allowed to run um, budget deficits, cities and towns are not allowed to run um, operational uh, uh, deficits. We are allowed to go into debt for uh, the construction of um, uh, required infrastructure, but we are required to have a balanced budget. We have to comply with state statute. And so um, some of the things that we're gonna be talking about in the various uh, sessions are things like the open meeting law. The basics of the open meeting law, or as, if I take myself as an example, um, in the town of Gilbert, uh, I follow very closely what, um, what is going on. I take a look at the agendas and um, then I make that decision as to whether or not I'm going to attend that meeting, you know, either online or I'm going um, to go in and, and watch. Because again, the, the basic tenet of the open meeting law is that I as a citizen be allowed to participate or you know, at least view um, what is going on and how uh, decisions are deliberated by my, my council. Um, we also talk about, we're gonna talk about the conflict of interest law. Uh, one of the interesting things, again, as I go out and travel and, and meet with various councils is I often ask the question, is it bad for an elected official to have a conflict of interest? Um, Again, the answer may surprise you. It's not a bad thing for, especially in very small communities. Uh, my parents live in a very small community uh, up in the White Mountains, um, Eager, Arizona. Um, and they have a very uh, small community. And again, people that run for town council are people who participate in clubs, they own property. Um, and so they may have a conflict. The conflict only becomes a problem when um, that particular elected official participates in a debate um, about something that may benefit them monetarily. And again, um, we're going to have a session that talks about those things and you'll get more information on it. But we are also always available as league staff to come out and talk about those types of things if you need a refresher um, from time to time in your council meetings. Um, you may have uh, term limits, um, that's, a, that's a local decision. Most of the cities and towns, or I should say most of the cities that have um, uh, term limits are charter cities. Um, city officials are subject to recall. And um, again, you know, that's, that's uh, um, part of the Arizona constitution, how it was set up uh, in 1912, um, part of the progressive era uh, led to 
uh, some of the things that we're going to uh, talk about, and that's recall and refer referendum and initiative. Um, city, cities and towns, uh, their elected officials are, can be subject to recall um, with if enough people file a petition and, and, uh, and present it to the, to the town. Uh, local ordinances are su subject to referendum. Again, a form of a petition to actually uh, to stop a local ordinance from moving forward. But all of these things were created to serve local constituents and to make sure that their needs and their desires were being carried out. Um, how are cities governed? This is, this is a, a big part of what um, uh, I'm gonna talk about today because um, it's really important to understand, you know, kind of what you're getting yourself into uh, when you, you know, get onto these bodies to understand the philosophy behind what's been adopted. Um, mayors and council are elected at large or by districts. Again, most cities and towns in Arizona uh, get, uh, are um, general law cities, elect their uh, officials at large. Um, most of them directly elect their mayor. And um, although there is a choice um, to have the council select the mayor, most uh, cities and towns have elected to do that at large. Some cities and towns have established districts. That used to be that only a charter community could establish districts and have uh, voting by district. But now that is available to any uh, city or town that would like to do that. Uh, and again, districts is the whole idea that um, of your seven council members, uh, uh, you know, you may have six districts that elect um, a, a council, but the mayor uh, will be elected at, at large in, in even in uh, the district form. So I think that um, of the 91 cities and towns, um, we have 88 that have formally adopted the council manager form of government. And even in those other three communities that I'm talking about, they haven't formally adopted um, anything. They're, they're very small communities. And um, they have decided that uh, they'll act like, and usually they're, they, uh, because they're small, they have a small staff. And so uh, the clerk or the manager in charge there will um, act like other managers do, but they just haven't formally adopted it. So what is the council manager form of government and, and, um, and how did that come to be in, in Arizona? So we're gonna take some, some time with this and uh, I really wanna you know, kind of stress it because we get a lot of, of questions about this. And so I wanna make sure we understand it as, as best we can. Um, council is the policy making body Mayor is the chair or facilitator, but has an equal vote with other council members. And the city is managed by uh, professional staff, but led by a city manager. So how did this, how did this come about? Um, you know, most people, when they think about, you know, you watch any movie um, that's on, you know, that was done before, you know, 1970, you, you sh they show the mayor with the top hat and the big cigar, and they're the ones making all the, calling all the shots, et cetera. Um, in the 19, um, around 1910, uh, there was the progressive movement going on. Again, uh, uh, Arizona and its formation was kind of caught up in this era. Uh, and there was a movement to try to take out some of the corruption that was happening in uh, cities and town uh, halls across the country. Uh, if you, you know, are like me, I actually had a civics course in school. It's unfortunate that it's not taught as much anymore, but um, they talked about Tammany Hall and about uh, some of the corruption that would happen. Uh, uh, an elected official would come in, they would bring in their staff. Um, sometimes there was a uh, graft, you know, contracts were given uh, based on political uh, favoritism. And so, uh, the progressive era sought to make changes so that that didn't happen anymore. Um, and so what, what happened was is that there was a community uh, called Stanton, Virginia, and um, 
they decided that they were going to try to put together something that worked like the corporation that was so prevalent in the United States. And that would be that um, you have in the corporate structure, you have shareholders. Those are the people that uh, are answered to from the corporate structure. Uh, the, they would elect a board of directors and the board of directors were responsible for those things that the shareholders wanted to see the company do. Um, what kind of products they wanted to have it make, how it would conduct its business. The board of direct directors would take that under advisement and they would create a corporate philosophy. How are we going to conduct business? Who are we focused on? What are our products going to be? Then they would create documents. Um, they, would, they would hire a CEO and that CEO, the chief executive officer would create um, or, or, or do draft budgets um, other plans about uh, taking things to market, all of those types of things would be, uh, would be first taken, undertaken by the CEO, and then the board of directors would go in, make the changes that they saw necessary, and then they would adopt those, those things and give the CEO direction on the uh, carrying out of, of business. The CEO, in turn, would hire um, department heads and other employees, um, and all of those employees would be responsible to the chief executive officer. Because again, the board of directors is not responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of, of the uh, business itself. They have a set of goals, they have a philosophy, and what they're watching is to make sure that the day-to-day -day operations and the, and the um, and the tasks undertaken by the CEO actually lead to the outcomes that are stated in their, uh, in their board documents. And it, it's easy because again, the board of directors normally that is not their job. Um, they belong to, uh, they do other things but they were put there, vote elected to the board of directors um, because the shareholders wanted experienced people that could come up with a vision. The CEO is someone who is well-versed in the type of business that they're conducting. They are well-versed in best practices, in the latest um, in approaches to business. Those are all things that are their responsibility. And it makes it easier for those, uh, uh, those employees to know that they answer to one person. Either it's their direct report and their direct port report reports to the CEO. All the hiring and firing and HR decisions are made by that person. That keeps the board of directors out of any of that type of, of issue. And the reason that that's important is because they have other jobs, this isn't something that they, um, that they are trained to do, that they that they actually want to do. That's something that they should they leave to the CEO. So how does that translate to the council manager form of government? Well, it's the it's the same philosophy. Citizens go out and they know what they want for their community, and they go out and they hire a mayor or excuse me elect uh, mayor and, and and a city council. The the, the mayor and the city council, what are their board documents? Well, um, the city manager and the staff will help them by creating budget documents, uh, the general plan, um, the uh, zoning maps, uh, any variety of reports for those decisions that the mayor and council have to undertake. The citizens want, the reason that they elected you was not so that you would make decisions about what potholes are going to be filled or you know, um, what report is gonna be undertaken by the finance department or, or what programs are, or you know, who, which employee is going to run a park program. They hired you for the 30, they elected you for the 30,000 foot 
level decisions. Um, again, uh, what, what do we want to see? What do we want our community to look like? That is a lot of that is the, the planning and zoning. Um, what types of recreational activities make sense for our community? What types of things are they interested in? Um, should we be involved in specific types of utilities? Um, you know, do we have water and sewer? Are there other types of, of utilities? Do we have a city cemetery? Should we, should we undertake that? Those are all the types of decisions because you are a citizen of that community. You're a, a leader in that community. Um, people look to you to provide leadership. That's what they want you to do. The manager that is hired is, is the person who receives training um, in school. Uh, a lot of our city managers have um, MPAs and, uh, and also are associated with professional development associations like the International City County Man Managers Association on the national level at the state level with the Arizona City County Management Association. And they go and they receive training on uh, what the latest uh, legal requirements are for a variety of city and town issues. Um, they receive uh, training about uh, city finances. Uh, they receive trainings about HR. They know or have familiarity with all of the types of operations that you're gonna have as a city or town. Things that again, because in Arizona, the vast majority of, of cities and towns, you have a working council. And that council is, has, they have other jobs. They're, uh, they're attorneys and school teachers and doctors and, um, and they're retired people. And so they don't have time to be as thoroughly familiar with day-to-day -day operations. Now, that is not to say that you will never have questions about how a city manager is conducting day-to-day -day operations, but you should never ever as a council member go around a city manager directly to an employee. One of the things that we talk about, the success, cities and towns enjoy the greatest success and effectiveness when the mayor and council and the city manager have a good working relationship. We're gonna have an entire uh, session about how a good manager works with a good council. And I'll just start off by saying that in my 20 years of, well, it's almost 25 now uh, in working with cities and towns, where mayor and council enjoy the greatest um, success and also the greatest sense of accomplishment is when they work well with the manager and they see uh, things that they want to do carried out. It's also really uh, important to remember that as a council, even the mayor, although the mayor is the one that runs the meetings and acts uh, certainly as a figurehead, the mayor is also only one vote on the council. In order to pass something uh, as a council, you have to have four people. If your um, if the things that you want to do are not being reflected in the votes that are being taken, it's really, really important as a new council member to reach out and talk about this with, with other um, members of the council. Now there's a proper way to do that. I won't go into that a lot because we'll talk about that um, as a, an issue in, uh, with the open meeting law. We have to be careful about who we meet with and how and when. Even more importantly, I think it's very important as, uh, as a mayor or a member of the city council to sit down and talk with the manager when you have issues, try to work those out, let the manager uh, care, you know, know those things that you're concerned with. And then if necessary, that's something that you can bring up and discuss at a council meeting um, under a, an, an agenda. Uh, the time. I have found that if a council member and a manager are willing to work uh, with one another, that um, they usually can work out any kinds of issues that they have. Now, where does it fall apart? It can fall apart in two ways. If a member of the council decides that um, they don't like something that the manager's doing and they want to direct um, an employee to do something 
and they go around the manager and don't talk to them ahead of time and they instruct somebody to do something that creates a real problem. It creates a problem for the employee who wants to please the council, but also wants to please the manager. The manager has given them different instruction and the council member has given them different instruction and it creates a difficult situation for that employee. That's how we can, that's one of the biggest ways that the council manager form, you know, that uh, it's, if the manager is not allowed uh, to do their job, it can fall apart very quickly. Now, the other part is where if the manager um, is not doing their job as far as if they're pushing a certain policy on the mayor and council, a good manager will be there, there'll be a, a council may request uh, alternatives uh, to a, a specific approach. Um, let's say that they have to, they're going to build, uh, well, let's say they're going to start a certain program again in the recreational uh, part of the, of the city. They ask the manager and the staff to come up with alternatives. A good manager will never um, talk about that in terms of policy. They'll simply state what they, the, the pros and cons of each, um, of each alternative and present that to the mayor and council for discussion. And the mayor and council is the one that makes that policy decision. And then the good manager will take whatever policy decision is made and will carry that um, out for the council. The other thing that's important for the mayor and the council is for if four members of the council believe that the manager is not performing, the manager can be removed. That's exactly the same type of structure that you see in, um, in American corporations. So again, it's uh, the most important thing to remember about the council manager form of government is it, we often hear we should run cities like a business. My answer to that is we do. Now, it's not a small business because we have um, a mayor and council and we have something that's very important that's called um, and now something that's very important, which I've forgotten. Um, we have due process. Thank you. Finally came back. Um, we have due process in place, which means that we have laws and, and um, regulations that are in place on how we go about making decisions. We can't have a single person like we do in a small business making a decision. In a movie. That means that sometimes that the, the corporate structure is gonna move a little bit slower. But what it does is it protects the rights of every citizen and it gives the opportunity for um, representatives on the council to have a say in how um, decisions are made and how things move forward. So if things are working right, the mayor, the, the citizens elect a council, the council um, sets its policy framework work through its documents that they create and they give that direction to the manager that carries out the day-to-day -day activities. And for the vast majority of cities and towns, this works well all the time. Again, where it breaks down is what we just alluded to, mayor and council working around the manager or the manager not allowing the mayor and council to be the policy decision makers. So, Let's move on then to when it's working well, cities and towns can have a great effect on the economy. Now, even in the smallest of towns, um, uh, you are providing um, not only employment opportunities, but you're employing housing, um, you're, in, you're providing uh, opportunities for retail, for small business, that can uh, be conducted in, in your community. It's funny when we look back um, at the five C's that, again, some of those are still very important, but um, cop cotton, cattle, copper, citrus, and climate. But we've also moved in, into other areas and um, there are other industries that are really important. And cities and towns are on the front line of, of that. Um, most of the people, um, that live in Arizona, 80% live within the incorporated boundaries of a city or town. 
And it's also where um, the largest percentage, over 90% of sales tax is collected in cities and towns. So our operations are very important to the overall um, economic climate in the state. Let's take a look at um, some revenues. Uh, one of the things that is also surprising um, to many people who come into the state is that uh, we are very, very, very dependent on sales tax. Both sales tax that we generate ourselves locally, which again, the average city and town gets 43% of their operating funds from local sales and franchise taxes. Um, but we also get a share of what the state collects in sales tax. And so that means that, um, uh, again, a large portion, uh, up over 50% um, of what we use to, um, to fulfill um, our directives for services and other things locally is the sales tax. Only 7% on average um, uh, is local property tax. Only half of the cities and towns in Arizona have a property tax. Um, and uh, many of them just have a, a general operating tax. But in Arizona, there's also the opportunity that we have for secondary property tax that um, is associated with a bond election. And uh, with, um, uh, and that is the way that, that people agree to pay off those bonds. So for example, if you decide that you're going to build a fire station or you're going to you know, extend your sewer system and you go out and you ask the, the voters if that's okay, they agree that their property taxes um, can go up for uh, that particular project. But again, it's not a, a huge part of um, the revenues that we receive locally. Um, we also have, um, we actually get more from our licenses, permits. Many cities and towns have uh, business licenses. Uh, they do um, building permits. Um, they have user fees for particular things. This is all, user fees are a big part of how we, um, we pay for uh, parks and recreation services. Um, fines and forfeitures are becoming an even smaller part. Um, uh, the state legislature has kind of clamped down on um, what we can do with fines and forfeitures, but most of those fines are related to, to traffic. Um, and our state shared revenue system, there are four types of shared revenue. There's the state shared sales tax, which I've already mentioned. Uh, we get 15% of the state income tax. Um, we got that back in 1972 um, so that um, we could have a portion of the income tax, but not have our own uh, separate income tax. That would just um, be very, very confusing um, uh, to, to taxpayers. Um, also, uh, we have something called uh, the Highway User Revenue Fund. When you go to the pump, there's 18 cents a gallon that is the uh, gas tax. And there are other um, fees and taxes that are also belong to the Highway User Revenue Fund. But this is the fund that we receive um, to help us with, again, I mentioned that the two things that we're required to do are um, police services and roads. Highway User Revenue Funds are specifically dedicated. They have to be accounted for separately and they have to be used for road, maintenance, operation, and um, repair. And so um, uh, that is a, a very important uh, source of, of revenue to us. And then finally, we have the, um, the vehicle license tax. Um, all of you know that every couple of years we have to license our, our cars. And so the money that comes from that um, is also a part of our revenue system. One of the things that's really important is that with the, um, with the exception of the HERF, all of these funds are general fund revenues. And so HERF is one of those things that we uh, account for separately. And uh, 
part also part of a session that you're going to have later. We'll talk about something um, called a um, and uh, today this is the second uh, uh, my synapses are not firing. But there are different types of funds that sometimes account for things separately in your budget. Most everything falls under the general fund revenue, but HERF and other um, things like um, your sewer system, your water system, if you have an electric utility, those things are all accounted for separately because they're utilities that use um, uh, user fees. And so they are accounted for and treated like their own separate business. So where does uh, city and town money get spent? Uh, the largest uh, expenditure way up over 50% is, is public safety. For many, I shouldn't say many, for several cities and towns, it's even higher. It can go as high as 60 to 70%. Um, public work, administration, community services, economic development, uh, development services, parks and recreation, those are all important parts of, of what we expend. And again, just to be clear, um, we can't run an operational deficit. And so all of those things have to fit under our, our revenue umbrella. Um, it's always interesting to me to talk to people about the, um, uh, the truth about cities and towns and population. Um, more than half of our cities and towns are under 10,000 in population. And even a good portion of that half is under 5,000. So what most people would consider a very small town, more than half of our cities and towns are considered small towns. And, um, and we consider that a strength um, as, as, city, as uh, league staff. And so the things that we do, um, we try to find things that are of value to, to, to all cities and towns, but um, some league services will be used more by small cities and towns and larger cities and towns may use different types of services. And so we try to be uh, aware of the needs of all of our cities and towns and the way that we do that. And it's been very difficult for me um, not to be able to go out and, and visit um, with you directly um, as things start to hopefully improve as the vaccine comes out and, and uh, we start to have um, more openings. Um, we are going to get out on the road and come out and see you and talk to you about your needs and how we can uh, provide even more value to you um, as cities and towns. As I mentioned in the beginning, um, each city is, is unique. Um, the people create cities. Um, the state legislature doesn't form our boundaries. They do form the boundaries of counties. Um, we we have been a group of people in order for cities and towns to exist. Um, a group of people have had to got to get together and form a boundary and hold an election that says we want a city or a town. And so to us, that's a very important thing. And that is one of the reasons that we believe in local control and local decision-making. Each city meets the needs of their own community. Um, different service needs, different service levels. Sometimes um, uh, we can take a look at uh, two, let's take a look at two Maricopa County cities and town. City of Mesa, for example, is very different from the city of, um, uh, or the town of Paradise Valley. The city of Mesa is a full service uh, community that provides um, uh, most of their services with city or town employees. The town of Paradise Valley, on the other hand, does a lot of things through contracts. That does not mean that one is a better system than the other. It only means that um, they have chosen different paths based on what they have heard from their communities and what their elected officials have decided is in the best interests of, of their communities. And we would never ever try to insinuate or allow the state to insinuate themselves on those kinds of decisions. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the choice of where people live reflects their values. There are reasons that people choose to live in Sedona or Eager or Gilbert. Um, they take a look at the community. They take a look at the schools. They take a look at um, you know, the availability of um, 
uh, hospitals or they are looking for a more rural lifestyle. They are retired and they want the don't want the hustle and bustle. Um, and so that, again, there are no right or wrong reasons. Um, we just try to, to um, remind people that those decisions and, and the types of values that are reflected in communities um, are best decisions that are made by uh, city and town councils. We also, um, a lot of times, uh, we'll hear from council members, well, I don't think this is right, and I want to know who I can talk to to correct something that's happening on the council. Now, um, a lot of times, those, those types of issues are, um, are part of state law, and, but sometimes they're not. And when there's not a process in state law, we at the league uh, really try to encourage uh, council members and, um, and city and town employees to work together to, to self-correct, um, to try to come uh, to agreement on how things sh should be done. Um, the last thing that we think is a good idea is to involve a state level agency uh, to direct cities and towns on how they should do something. Um, and so that's something that, uh, that we will always fight. And especially when they're trying to pass a law where one size fits all, and it may not, it may work in a handful of communities, but doesn't work in others. Um, we really don't like that type of, of, uh, of legislation that we see come through. And we will reach out to your communities to, to have you help us with your, the legislators that represent you to try to stop that type of uh, legislation from getting through. Okay, one really important thing to remember is that we have a representative system. People elect you to make decisions. Uh, they direct you to, um, they don't, we don't have a system where we fill up the room and have people raise their hands. People elect you and they expect you to use your best judgment. They elect you for character and for attitude and for vision, and they expect you to use it. We have a representative democracy. And the reason I say a representative democracy is because we do have, people do have the ability to come in and recall you and they do have the opportunity to talk to you about what they care about. And so, um, but when it comes down to it, when you're up on that dais, what they expect for you is to use your best judgment in decision-making. One of the things that I find myself talking about a lot uh, lately, and it's really difficult for me, is be we're becoming more and more uncivil as a society. And it is reflecting itself in our, in our council meetings. This is something that shouldn't be. Um, and oftentimes it's, it's, um, it's for a number of reasons, usually uh, partisan politics, local politics um, see, creep their way into, the, into the, the council chambers. We are very, very big and want to be a resource to communities about how to conduct yourselves. When you allow yourselves to have meetings turn into chaos, where there is name calling, where there are accusations, um, you create a level of mistrust and people don't know whether they can trust the council. What we prefer to see is council meetings that are run uh, using, it doesn't necessarily need to be Robert's rules, but using some type of parliamentary procedure where people are talking over one another, where, the, where the, the public can address one person and that one person directs, and that's the mayor. And, that and, and the mayor directs that, that conversation. Another thing then again, this will be talked about in the open meeting a lot, but one thing that again, surprises many people is that cities and towns offer a call to the public, but you are not, it is not a uh, constitutionally protected right in the Arizona constitution that someone who comes to a council meeting automatically has a right to address the council. 
the only right that exists in, um, in, the, in the Arizona Constitution is the right to hear the debate on things that are on the agenda and to see how, um, how the decision is made, um, whether or not you vote uh, a, an issue up or down. So that is why the open meeting law is so important because again, um, it's, it's very, very important that people feel that you are conducting your business in an open way and that they know that, hey, even if there is strong opinions on an issue, there is a way to do that in a civil manner with decorum. Many uh, councils have adopted a, um, a set of rules and, and a, a set of decorum for their council meetings. This isn't a legally binding document, but your colleagues will often expect you to follow those, that, those rules and decorum. And, and basically what it is, is that uh, to keep your cool, um, some things that I, would, that I have seen over the years. One of the things that really frustrates me when I come, and one of the things that leads to a lot of um, uh, of un, unnecessary questioning and, um, and confusion is that some council members will open their council packet as they're sitting down at the dais, okay? That is utterly shocking to me. Um, you are elected and you get those packets much sooner than that. And I would hope and I would express to you the importance of opening that council packet and really reviewing and giving um, the opportunity to your staff to answer questions that you might have or um, ahead of time, not that they can't answer your questions in a council meeting, but oftentimes they'll simply refer you to the information you're looking for in that packet. And that can be embarrassing for you uh, to let people know that you haven't even read the information that, that the staff has provided to you. So I hope that none of you will do that. Also, I, it is, um, there are various reasons um, with our cell phones and, and other things that uh, we, have to, we have to have access to that. You should really try to limit, if, if at all possible, not use your phone at all, unless it's an emergency situation. Also side conversations um, up on the dais, um, people are going to assume that you're talking about city business even if that is the furthest thing from what you're discussing. It's really, really important that you present an aura of trust. Um, trust will be um, given to a council that will debate the issues and debate doesn't necessarily mean um, rancorous um, mudslinging back and forth. Debate merely means that you are discussing public business in an open forum. And that, then that discussion is considered debate. And so the opportunity should be given and the mayor should make sure that all parties are being heard on the council. If there's a required um, public hearing that, you know, um, that there are proper limits set on uh, time if you want to have that, but that all ideas and, um, and people are being heard at those at those meetings. But again, um, one of the things you'll talk about in the open meeting laws is it's very important to make sure that when you have a call to the public, that they understand that many times you won't be able to discuss their issue at the council meeting, but you may be able to in the future or, or that staff may be able to answer their question and uh, you can move along. But again, all of these things, the reason that they're all in place is to maintain the public's trust in you. And we have done a very good job of that because we have really eliminated a lot of the problems that we were having with open meeting law. But um, we're gonna have a, a very good attorney talk to you about that and the pitfalls of, of the open meeting law. The other thing is that sometimes um, people that get elected uh, when they have certain issues that they deeply care about, or they may have, um, unfortunately, an ax to grind for lack of a better term. Um, and they find when they come in 
that that is not reflected in the values of the other council members. And so in order to get things done, you have to compromise and you have to be willing um, to, um, to work with, with other folks and, and talk with them about things. And uh, those people who are willing uh, to compromise and who are willing to work with the manager on all, alternative ideas and, um, and, and again, are willing to be a part of a cohesive body, find that they're much more satisfied in their experience. Again, one of the really difficult things to do too is oftentimes you're elected because people have heard your opinion and have seen you exercise leadership on th in things like Facebook and um, uh, on Twitter and you know in public forums and, or in HOA. When you become an elected official, what you say is news. Um, right, you know, beforehand, you know, before you got on the council, what you said on Facebook probably wasn't necessarily news, but what you say now is, and how you say it, and when you say it, and who you say it to, all are regulated, and they can, they can definitely get you in trouble. It is really, really important that you make sure, um, I, I have a simple, when I first came to work for the league, um, I worked directly for um, uh, Kathy Connolly, who was the longtime um, uh, deputy director, and she was the also the executive director for a number of years. And Kathy used to always say to groups that if you don't want your mother to read about it on the front page, be careful what you say. So that is a that is a, a while it's kind of trite, it's absolutely true, and. Um, you need to be guarded in the things that you say. You need to be open about how you feel and when you're on the dais, but um, what you say out in the public, especially when you're not in a council meeting, you really need to be very careful about that. And as much as possible, you need to make, you need to understand that people are watching you. Um, they are watching, you know, who you're associating with. Um, if there are other council members that you're seated with at the local high school basketball game, those are all things that they pay attention to. And they want to make sure that the, the public's business is being conducted in an open way and that they have access to those conversations. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't have conversation with, with individual citizens and those kinds of things. It, it, you absolutely can and uh, but it's just very important that you know what the limitations are, specifically your communications with the other members of the council. All right. Limitations on local authority. Uh, just quickly, we talked about the first part. Um, there is a there was a bill passed um, uh, three or four years ago, maybe five now. Um, uh, Senate Bill 1487 that says that if a city or town um, uh, operates uh, and does anything that's in violation of uh, state statute that um, a 1487, uh, 1487 claim can be filed. And that means that um, if you're found in violation that they can take your, your shared revenue away. And um, that is not a situation that any of us wanna be in. Um, just to let you know, we are very on, on top of those things. And if your community ever has that happen to them, um, we will coordinate with your, um, with your city attorney uh, locally. And so uh, it's very important that we um, keep that communication uh, going. Um, the courts will often come in um, and through court cases, uh, they will uh, limit or allow things. Um, those types of um, decisions come down all the time. There was one that came down yesterday related to the attorney general and, um, uh, and their power to, um, uh, to pass um, edicts onto state agencies. And so um, our general counsel is in contact with um, uh, the local city and town attorneys and uh, will send out information on uh, those decisions as well. If you have a charter, again, um, 19 cities and towns in the state have a charter. If you have one, um, how you 
approach a, a specific item may be different from, from general law. So we just wanted to make you aware of those things. Fine, I just wanna um, end a, a little bit about the league, talk a little bit more about it, and then we'll get to your questions. We are a voluntary nonpartisan nonprofit association of all the incorporated cities and towns. And we, all 91 um, cities and towns are members of the league. Um, we were formed in 1937. Um, we have, there are similar organizations in, in 48 other states. Um, Hawaii, I think, I believe that's 49. I believe Hawaii is the only one that doesn't have a, um, a league now. Um, founded on principles of home rule and local decision making. That's been the theme of, of my entire presentation today. Um, we also um, have set up a self-insurance uh, program for cities and towns, uh, about 70, uh, maybe as high as 75 now, of the cities and towns um, get their liability insurance um, through, this, through the AMRRP program. Our core principles are to maintain local control and protect um, shared revenue. And um, we, we try the basics of what the league tries to do is um, if there is something that we can do on your behalf that all cities and towns would have to do and you would have to dedicate staff time to do that. Um, if there is something that we can do that facilitates what you're doing locally and it would be something that all 91 cities and towns are doing, um, we uh, want to undertake that on your behalf. Also, we are very committed to technical assistance. We hope that when you have a question that you will feel free to pick up the phone and call us first. Oftentimes we will have the answer. Most of the time we will have the answer for you. If we don't, we know where we can direct you. And um, if we don't have the answer and don't know where to direct you, then we will do the research and try to to help you find those answers. So we hope that we will be your first phone call. Now, one of the important things that I wanna make sure that you understand is as newly elected officials is that oftentimes you'll want to call and talk to our attorney, okay? I want you to understand that our attorney oftentimes will talk about and, and will review our publications and will talk in general terms about what is required of cities and towns. However, please do not use our general counsel as a way to get a second opinion that you can stick in front of your local attorney. What we prefer for you to do is if you really have a question is to have your attorney contact the league attorney. Uh, that way um, everybody is aware of what's going on because Christina um, does not, would not represent you in court um, and your local attorney would. And so um, it's very important that that, not, um, that that not take place. Otherwise, for other general types of questions, you can always feel free. If you have questions about a training, if you have questions about a program, always feel free to pick up the phone and, and call us. We talk a lot with your um, employees. Uh, there isn't a day go by that we that I don't have three or four, four phone calls, and the same with the rest of the staff. So that is what we are here for, and we hope we make you make use of that. Um, probably the biggest and most important thing that we do is we represent your interests at the state legislature. Uh, that is a two-way street. Um, we will call on you often to help us with a particular legislator on a particular um, uh, issue. So. Um, please keep an eye out for that and let us know if you have any um, close relationships with any of the legislators in your district. And uh, that is always very helpful to us in reaching out to them and educating them on how a bill uh, hurts us or helps us. Um, training, education, and publications. Um, I just uh, invite you to um, to uh, talk um, or to get onto our website and take a look at everything that is offered there. We have training classes, obviously, you're, you're participating in one. We had the league conference this year, we had to do it by Zoom, and man, I concur with Matt, that was not fun. 
we are planning to have an in-person conference um, in uh, early September of this year. Um, whether or not it's a, it's a hybrid type of conference where we, we offer some things uh, on Zoom and we do other things in person, um, that's still to be determined. But my hope is by that date that we're in a position that uh, everyone can come and enjoy um, the most important part of the conference, which is getting together with your colleagues and, and discussing the things that you're doing. Um, there's also other many other um, items here. We do model ordinances, we do legal advice, um, we have the model city tax code. These are all things that um, will be talked about over the course of the next uh, couple of days. And uh, there's just many, many ways that we can help you. And we hope that you will uh, take advantage of that. Uh, we operate under a strategic plan that, that I want to make you aware of that is adopted by our executive committee which is made up of 25 uh, council, uh, uh, mayors and council members from across the state. And so um, the work that we do is all um, uh, driven by this strategic plan. And with that, Matt, I'm happy to, to take any questions. Great, um, thanks, Tom. Yeah, we do have a, a few questions. And, and before we start the questions, I would just echo what Tom had to say. Say, um, you know, many of uh, many of the things he talked about will either be uh, talking about uh, in the days to come, uh, whether it's social media, open meeting law, conflict of interest, budget. Uh, but I would also encourage you to, to go to our website, um, and those links were provided to you um, in the email yesterday. So if you didn't get the, that link, please let me know, uh, or you can email league at azleague.org and we can send you those links again, because we have uh, links to our YouTube page, our uh, social media, as well as our website that has our publications on there. And for example, there are some publications about charter government. So if you wanna learn more about those types of things, I encourage you to go there. Um, all right, so we do have some questions, Tom. Uh, the, the first question is, why are there uh, uh, only two types of local government or um, why are the other two types of local government, strong mayor um, and uh, a weak mayor, uh, uh, mayor council so seldom used in Arizona? So I think the question is really, why is it that Arizona is predominantly council manager and, and not a, a strong mayor like many of the East Coast cities are? Again, um, this is part of, of uh, what I would point to is that this is just part of a prevailing feeling in our cities and towns that the council manager form of government um, protects the um, the protects the, the council as well as the employees from uh, things that um, if, if you're, a, if the mayor, if uh, under a strong mayor, basically uh, the mayor becomes the, the manager of the town. When the manager is making decisions as well as carrying out administrative functions, that can lead to, to problems that, that we discussed that were happening, you know, back in the early 1900s that can you know be that could lead to graft and corruption. Now, I would never accuse current cities of, of having that happen, but um, people uh, like the idea of having that corporate structure and having that manager in place that helps them to to you know they don't have to worry about the day to day functions. They just have to worry about uh, seeing the, the the philosophies and the programs and things that they set forth in their documents carried out. And so I think it's just a choice that reflects the values of the individual community. Thanks. Uh, the next question, Tom, and, and this will be also something that uh, Pat Walker, who's uh, uh, will be doing our budget session, will we'll, we'll talk a little bit about and, and you can ask her. But the question is, what if a town is operating with a deficit? Well, um, we, the town um, and, you know, again, Pat will be a good person to talk about this. If the town is operating on an operational deficit, um, they are opening themselves up to, to, to liability. And so they need to find a way to, you know, to change that quickly. That is a very difficult thing to do. It means making cuts. It means, you know, changing 
certain things. And, um, and so again, uh, those are decisions that can only be made locally, but we do have uh, people and resources that we can, um, that we can recommend to you uh, to help you to make those difficult decisions. But um, the, most, the, the biggest problem with doing that is you do open yourself up uh, to liability by uh, you know, operating any kind of operational deficit. Okay, the next question is, what advice does the league have on term limits? Uh, you know, again, um, this is, this is uh, what advice I give is to really um, think about that. There's a lot of pros and cons. Um, I have seen mayors that have served uh, for over 40 years in their community and, and people thought that they did a terrific job and that, um, and, and they, some of them were really considered the heart and soul of their communities and their council members uh, the same way. Um, I, in other communities, um, they didn't get a chance to throw the bum out. Uh, that, that's a prevailing feeling. Again, the thing that I always encourage cities and towns to do is to find out what is kind of, you know, um, how do people feel about it locally? Um, what is it, what they would like to see and how do other members of the council feel? Um, vast majority of cities and towns don't have them because they're general, uh, general law cities and it's a little more difficult to get it done if you're a general law city. Um, but um, again, what you do should reflect how people feel locally. If they feel that they, they wanna have turnover, again, when you have more turnover, what you give up is institutional knowledge, uh, knowledge of, of decision-making that was made before and why certain things were done. Why did a council do things this way? That may not be important to you, but to me, um, I find that institutional knowledge is a very important thing, not only in associations, but in cities and towns. And so um, to me, I wouldn't be in a rush to do that, but if, um, if you feel strongly about it, you should have that discussion as a council. Okay, the next question, um, will you specifically cover dealing with the press? And I can answer that. Um, we have a social media uh, session tomorrow and that's gonna cover social media, but uh, the speakers on that panel are, are communication experts for their, their communities. And so they'll be able to answer questions about how to deal with the press. And what we found is we used to have a session on how to deal with the press um, specifically, but as we all know, over the last 10 years, really communications have, have gone to the social media platforms. And so we're really focusing on that, but that will include how to deal with the press. And then if, if you have a specific question, I would encourage you to ask that panel tomorrow afternoon because um, they could provide some, some insight on, on how they recommend uh, best ways to deal with the press for their elected officials. Okay, the next question is, is having a city attorney a requirement or just highly recommended? It is a requirement, okay? Um, you, you don't have to have, and I wanna make sure that, that you understand what I mean. You don't necessarily have to have an in-house attorney. It can be attorney by contract, but uh, an attorney by contract that you know, is, is the, the compensation system is hourly, but you cannot conduct um, business as a city or town and not have an attorney. Um, and again, you know, um, there may be times as a council uh, that, that there's a legal, uh, you have a, a legal uh, questions and there's no way to get those answered. And believe me, you may have council members or people who are sitting on the council who think they know the law, but that's very different than being able to practice. So yes, it is a requirement. It's just not a requirement to have them as an in-house employee. They can be on an hourly, but uh, that when I go out to talk to, um, uh, you know, in places that are seeking incorporation and they talk about who are the employees that are absolutely necessary at the very beginning, we tell them that attorneys are one of those people. If you get sued, who's going to represent you? And when you become a government, that's the first thing that happens is people will, will sue you. So yes, an attorney is absolutely 100% required. Okay, the next question is, being nonpartisan, what aspects of partisan politics can we participate in? Can we be a pre precinct committeeman, 
a state committeeman, et cetera. That, you know, I've never ever been asked if they can be a precinct or, you know, a, 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 I'll have to find that out. Um, Matt, I will find that out and I will provide you that answer. And then um, if that person is in another session, um, you can read that answer out to them. I, that is a in, very interesting question. Now, becoming a council member doesn't change your uh, political. It only means that your office is nonpartisan. It doesn't mean you can obviously vote. You can you know, state your opinions. Um, they just can't. Um, uh, you can't, the, um, your campaign literature and that kind of thing is, is not supposed to um, uh, show any kind of party affiliation, but whether or not you can serve in those two um, specific offices is a good question. We get questions from time to time, you know, can I do this or can I, can I serve on a school board? And uh, we, we've had uh, questions about that that we have um, opinions for that I could send out, but I've never been asked about a committee man. So I'll find that out and uh, get that to you, Matt. Okay. Sounds good. Yep. Um, all right. The next question is in a small community, people will come up and ask for certain things to be done or addressed. What is the best way to accommodate their questions and not cross any lines? Again, talking to, if you are a single person talking to a single um, uh, community member, there is no issue with you chatting with them about anything. Um, and now the important part that, that we need to remember, and again, they'll go through this in the open meeting law training is the important part is that what you discuss with the council. So if a member of the community comes up and talks to you about that, they, they wanna see a leash law, you know, dogs need to be on leashes and, and, and we don't have an ordinance that does that. You know, I, I don't know, but just as, as an example. So um, you can talk with them about their feelings about that. And then what you can encourage them to do is um, to talk to other council members and um, individually, and then see if that's something that uh, you could get on an agenda. Um, again, we encourage you to have those kind of conversations with the community. You're not crossing any line. It's, it's, when other council members are present, especially if an issue that they're bringing up is going to go before the council. If they come on to talk to you about something that's gonna be on the agenda and you're by yourself with them, there's no issue. But if, if they come into contact with you and you're with other council members, that's a whole different thing. Because the idea is again, the debate between the council members, I have a right to hear. I, you know, I don't have a right to hear your private conversation with a private uh, constituent, but if a quorum of the council members are talking about something, I need to hear that. So that's the, that's the kind of the fine line. And again, we're going to drive that home in the, uh, in the uh, session we're going to have on that. Yeah. And, and I would just say, Tom, and, and to the question, questioner, uh, our next session on the council manager form of government uh, will be a discussion. We have a, a mayor on that, a, a city manager, um, and it, that's a great question for them because they can talk about the realities, kind of the gray area of what happens, how that works, and, and what are some of the best practices when, when you're confronted with these things. Because as Tom said, in small communities especially, you're going to uh, see people in the grocery store at restaurants and they're gonna come up to you as a mayor or a council member. So a uh, very good question. And, and I would uh, encourage you to ask that again in the next session. Okay, with that, uh, we are, are complete with our questions. Uh, Tom, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to all the attendees. Um, what we will do is we're gonna be back on for our next session at one o'clock. We will look forward to see. And then at the end of each day, I will send out a survey for the session that happened on that day. So look for a survey this afternoon from the league. Um, but again, thank you very much. We appreciate you taking the time to join us today in this virtual uh, newly elected officials training. And for those who are going to be on the council manager form of government session, we will see you in about an hour and a half. Um, thank you, everybody, and see you shortly. And thank you, Tom. Thank you. We look forward to seeing you, you know, all at the conference if, if that's possible and uh, look forward to having your questions and, and having you participate in the league. Uh, we're, we're very excited to have you. Thanks, Matt.